Yes. Okay. Uh, I didn't have time to uh, You prepare. have to give us your name. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Mark Robinson. I live at That's right here in Greensboro. I've lived in Greensboro all my life. Uh, I didn't have time to write a fancy speech. I didn't have time to, you know, I didn't have the, the resource of an English teacher to sit down and write a speech with at school today and be, you know, brought over here or practice or anything. What I really came down here for is this. Uh, I've heard a whole lot of people in here talking tonight about this group and that group and domestic violence and blacks, and these minorities and that minority. What I want to know is, when are you all going to start standing up for the majority? And here's who the majority is. I'm the majority. I'm a law-abiding citizen who's never shot anybody, never committed a serious crime, never committed a felony. I've never done anything like that. But it seems like every time we have one of these shootings, nobody wants to blame, put the blame where it goes, which is at the shooter's feet. You want to put it at my feet. You want to turn around and restrict my right constitutional right that's spelled out in black and white. You want to restrict my right to buy a firearm and protect myself from some of the very people you're talking about in here tonight. It's ridiculous. I don't think Rod Serling could come up with a better script. It does not make any sense. The law-abiding citizens of this community and many communities around this country, we're the first ones taxed and the last ones considered and the first ones punished when things like this happens because our rights are the ones that are being taken away. That's the reason why I came down here today, gun show or no gun show, NRA or no NRA. I'm here to stand up for the law-abiding citizens of this community because I'm going to tell you that what's going to happen. You can take the guns away from us all you want to. You all write a law, I follow the law, I'll bring my guns down here, I'll turn them in. But here's what's going to happen. The Crips and the Bloods on the other side of town, they're not going to turn their guns in. They're going to hold on to them. And what's going to happen when you have to send the police down there to go take them? The police can barely enforce the law as it is. It's what I see. We demonize the police, criminalize and, and, and vilify the police, and we make the criminals into victims. And we're talking about restricting guns? How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that when the police department's already hamstrung? You're not going to be able to go down here and take these guns from these criminals. So the criminals are going to hold on to their guns. They're still going to have them. They're still going to break in my house, and they're still going to shoot me with them. And guess who's going to be the one that suffers? It's going to be me. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight, it is not going to happen without a fight. And when I say fight, I don't mean shots fired. I don't mean fist thrown. I mean I'm going to come down here to this city council and raise hell just like these loonies from the left do until you listen to the majority of the people in this city. And I am the majority. The majority of the people in this city are law-abiding, and they follow the law, and they want their constitutional right to be able to bear, to bear arms. They want to be able to gun go to the gun show and buy a hunting rifle or a sport, or sport rifle. There are no military-grade weapons sold, showed, uh, sold at the uh, gun show. An AR-15 is not a military-grade weapon. Anybody that would go into combat with an AR-15 is a fool. It's a semi-automatic 22 rifle. You'd be killed in 15 minutes in combat with that thing. So we need to dispel all these myths, and we need to drop all this, all this division that we got going on here. Because the bottom line is, when that Second Amendment was written, whether the framers liked it or not, they wrote it for everybody. And I am everybody. And the law abiding citizens of this city are everybody. And we want our rights, and we want to keep our rights. And by God, we're going to keep them, come hell or high water. That is why law-abiding citizens buy millions of these firearms. When accuracy and stopping power matter, they are simply better. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, and distinguished members of Congress. My name is Amy Swearer, and I am the Senior Legal Policy Analyst at the Heritage Foundation's Ed Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Just as doctors can only recommend an effective treatment plan if they first form a correct diagnosis based on accurate assessment of the symptoms, Policy analysts and policy makers must have an accurate understanding of the societal problems they are seeking to combat. Unfortunately, too many policy makers appear completely uninformed about basic factual realities related to guns and gun violence. 
Don't misunderstand me. We all want safer communities. But the characteristics distinguishing so-called assault weapons from non-assault weapons are not factors like caliber, lethality, or rate of fire. Proposals to ban scary-looking features like barrel shrouds or pistol grips are, for all intents and purposes, proposals to force law-abiding citizens to own guns that are harder for them to handle, harder to fire accurately, and more likely to cause them injuries even when they are being used for lawful purposes. Moreover, semi-automatic rifles are not a meaningful driving factor behind rates of gun violence. Two-thirds of gun deaths in this country are suicides, where the type of firearm is essentially irrelevant. With respect to gun crimes, over 90% are committed with handguns. Rifles of any kind are definitively used in only 3 to 4% of gun homicides every year, and an American citizen is four times as likely to be stabbed to death than they are to be shot to death with a rifle of any kind. Despite frequent claims that semi-automatic rifles are the weapon of choice for mass public shooters, in the last decade, over half of these shootings have been carried out with handguns alone. On the other hand, semi-automatic rifles like the AR-15 are so well suited for defensive action against threats in a civilian context that the Department of Homeland Security quite literally designates them as personal defense weapons for law enforcement officers. It is little wonder, then, that millions of law-abiding citizens in this country also choose these types of semi-automatic rifles as their own personal defense weapons. Far from needing to be protected from these rifles, law-abiding Americans benefit when they are allowed to defend themselves with them, particularly in situations where they are outnumbered. Just last week, a homeowner in Rockdale County, Georgia, relied on his scary-looking semi-automatic assault weapon to defend himself against three masked teens armed with at least one handgun who tried to rob him and other residents in their own front yard. Ironically, the rifle deemed an assault weapon by many in this room was used defensively to protect innocent people against assault, while the perpetrators used a non-assault weapon offensively to commit actual assault. Importantly, some of the most famous examples of the defensive use of assault weapons by civilians come from scenarios where the government has been either unable or unwilling to defend entire communities from large-scale civil unrest. During the 1992 LA riots, for example, law enforcement was nowhere to be found as hundreds of looters ransacked Koreatown. Ordinary store owners like Richard Ree and his employees took it upon themselves to defend their livelihoods from lawlessness, using, in many cases, semi-automatic rifles. Similar stories emerged during the civil unrest in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. There are some here today who still genuinely don't understand why or how anyone would need such scary-looking rifles for purposes other than mass murder. And so I have permission from my mother to explain it to you by partially embarrassing her. My mother did not grow up with firearms, and they will never be her favorite thing in the world. In fact, she'd never handled a firearm until I took her to the range for the first time several years ago. Now, I love my mother, but like every other novice with a handgun, she was quite bad. I mean, she struggled to hit a stationary target from six yards out under ideal conditions. And then she picked up an AR-15. And I watched my mother put a fist-sized grouping of lead in the center mass of a target from 20 yards out. That is why law-abiding citizens buy millions of these firearms. When accuracy and stopping power matter, they are simply better. Americans use firearms to defend themselves between 500,000 and 2 million times every year. God forbid that my mother is ever faced with a scenario where she has to stop a threat to her life. But if she is, I hope politicians protected by professional armed security didn't strip her of the right to use the firearm she can handle most competently. Frankly, I hope she has in her hands the scariest looking assault weapon she can find so that we can both be confident in her ability to end the threat. Thank you. I strongly support this amendment. I, I think the gentleman from Louisiana made a, just a fundamental point is this is now this is as we speak right 50 facilities in 11 weeks and as the gentleman points out this all started after the leaked draft opinion the Dobbs opinion that was leaked uh, leaked I mean this is th th these are and the gentleman knows this because he represented these these entities but these are facilities where you where they help moms and expecting moms 
with clothes for children, with diapers, with formula, with food, with furniture for their apartments or homes. I mean, this is the Lord's work they're doing, and they have never seen anything like this, where in an 11-week time frame, 50 of these, along with some churches, have been systematically and for a, this sustained effort to target them simply because they're pro-life. And as, he, as the gentleman pointed out, if we can let bureaucrats at the Department of Education get an exemption, bureaucrats at the Department of Agriculture, but we're not going to let people who serve expecting mothers and mothers at centers that have been targeted systematically by the left 50 in 11 weeks, oh my goodness. This, this, this is as timely and as neat as, 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 as could, any amendment could be. And I would yield additional time to the, uh, to the gentleman from Louisiana for his, for his, to talk more about his great amendment. I thank you, the gentleman from Ohio. This is really outrageous, the opposition to this. The hubris of members of this committee to suggest that these people would not be, be able to defend themselves. Look, in these centers, you have some of the most vulnerable people in our population. You have you know, women, sometimes in late stages of pregnancy, you have um, uh, you know, older ladies serving them, younger ladies there. They often don't have budgets for security measures. They don't have security guards outside these facilities. Um, these are just peaceful, law-abiding citizens and they should have the right to defend themselves. The last I checked, at least in the last 11 weeks, guys, maybe I'm missing some records, but I don't think there's any bureaucrats at the Department of Agriculture who have uh, had any of their offices firebombed or threatened. I don't think anybody's after them, but you know, good for them. Good, hey, good for them. They can handle, they, they can have these, these weapons for self-protection, but the, the most vulnerable can't. I mean, it's a slap in the face. I, you know, obviously we believe all this is unconstitutional anyway, but the idea that you should be able to pick and choose which among the American citizens get to defend themselves with these weapons is to me absolutely outrageous. And heaven forbid, and we better pray, heaven forbid something doesn't happen at one of these facilities. I yield to Mr. B or back to Ms. Jordan, to Mr. Bishop. I thank the ranking member, and it, it does point out another aspect of this, because the Democrats said we're not confiscating anybody's weapons under this bill. We're going to leave the weapons that are outstanding. But Mr. Johnson's amendment points up how problematic that is. If you have someone who's never seen fit or, or been compelled by circumstances to feel it necessary to have a weapon mm -hmm. for self-defense, but then that person comes under mortal threat, mm -hmm. that's when someone, particularly as Mr. Biggs has pointed out, didn't talk about a man or a woman, but someone who is slight of build, mm. Uh, might want a, uh, an, uh, a, an AR-15 or a weapon like that in order to be able to handle it and defend themselves well. And that's the situation in which the Democrats seek to impose this ban. You want to take the, new, the people who are newly subject to a threat, in this case, pregnancy resource centers, for nothing that they have done, and in fact, they've, they've done nothing but care for people but uh, those hostile to them have come out, or hostile to life, have decided to victimize them uh, with threats of violence and violent acts. And so if at that unfortunate point, uh, someone in one or more of those circumstances would want to provide for the defense of people who are coming to that center or the employees there by having available a firearm banned under this law, they're out of luck. 20 million, there may be 24 million modern sporting rifles in the United States, but, the, but someone who now needs one because of a mortal threat, the and Democrats would bar from protecting. I yell back to the ranking member. And under the language of the bill, if someone wants to give those women who are at that crisis pregnancy center one of the weapons banned under the legislation, without, if they don't go through an FFL, they're in trouble. Mm. They're criminals. Mm. So you got a situation that is timely, that is present, where, where they're threatening these and attacking these facilities. And if you want to help them, provide them a weapon, oh, you're going to be in big Gentleman's trouble time if you do expired. that. Gentlemen's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Ms. Tiffany. 